I want people to understand this ordeal. It's taken a toll on both of us. Casey Anthony's parents respond after 15 years of allegations. I've gotten blamed for something I didn't do, and it tears me up inside. This can change our life. This is serious. This is their final response. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts, And on this episode, a powerful political consultant kills his wife in a murder-suicide. Why does his family think that investigators got that wrong? We'll review the WNYC podcast, Dead End, a New Jersey political murder mystery. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of the These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. You look really refreshed. You just got back from Florida. I did. Yeah. Oh, you're tan and you look relaxed. And Oh, I see. You're going ahead in time and pretending I'm just saying, like... it's Thursday and you yes. just flew in last night and you're so fresh. Yes. And it's not Friday when I haven't yet left for Florida or packed. Look Why at my itinerary do you got to pull the curtain all the uh, way back? Also with us is private Leave investigator. Leave a little mystery, my mom would say. This is super confusing. Certified pet detective, <laughs> resident cat lady, and author of Dead on Deadline, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Hello, Rebecca. And finally, our resident Doubting Thomas, the author of the City Trilogy, host of the Strange Arrivals podcast, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hi, Rebecca. So, Kevin, what is coming up on next week's shows? On Monday, we're going to be talking about the Hulu series Under the Banner of Heaven, starring Andrew Garfield. It's based on the true crime book by John Krakauer. Huh. Oh, the John Krakauer, famous author, John Krakauer. Yeah, of... Uh, in the into thin, thin air, air and into the wild. Up in smoke. Oh, no, that's Cheech and Chong. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Missoula was another one he wrote. Yes. Perfect Storm. No, that's Sebastian Younger. Oh, yes, right. That's uh, Sebastian yeah. Younger. He did yeah. Restrepo. He's good, yeah. too. They're both really good. Krakauer's books are awesome. Yes, they are actually really awesome. My son wrote a paper on a John Krakauer book this semester that I may or may not have had a major hand in helping him shape. Meaning you wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> What grade did you get, Rebecca? I think I got like a B plus. Yeah. I mean, it took 20 minutes. I mean, I had read the book. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you still put in twice as much effort. <laughs> so, Kevin, speaking of uh, children, yes, I have just, as of the dropping of this podcast, returned from Florida taking your, your child mm-hmm. on her graduation gift trip. You mean our child, but all right, whatever. (laughs) Well, she's your child. She's my stepchild, but um, she's my child of the heart. To Disney World. How did I enjoy it? I'm guessing that your mouse counselor, Debbie, (laughs) was able to get you on all the rides that you wanted. Mm. No, she just made the dinner reservations. I still had to go on that stupid app and book the rides myself. You mean you think you did? Yeah. You're you're projecting. I'm projecting into the future that I was able to successfully get on that Rise of the Resistance stupid Star Wars ride. (laughs) I want you to go on the Avatar ride. I'm going to tell you in the future, Laura, that I did, in fact, go on the Avatar ride. It did not make me motion sick. I'm just going to project that into the future. Mm. I did, in fact, Kevin, get on that Rise of the Resistance thing, and it was awesome. I bet you're really jealous of me right now. Totally. I'm very tan. I see you, Jake Sully. I definitely do not have COVID from going to Florida and being around a million people. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything is great. All right. So, yes, it was an adventurous trip. And I guess I will tell you how it actually went when I actually do come back. Maybe you'll have a great story for the after show. We'll see. We'll see if I come back alive and with any money at all, because this might be the most expensive thing I have ever done in my life. Oh, I hope not. (laughs) All right. Well, I think we should get to the uh, podcast that we are reviewing this episode. And so, Kevin, uh, should we go ahead and drop that first clip? I think you should. 
I've done little else but try to figure out what happened to John and Joyce Sheridan and why a case involving such a prominent figure was ignored by the highest levels of law enforcement and government. In 2014, authorities discovered the bodies of political consultant John Sheridan and his wife, Joyce, in the bedroom of their New Jersey home. A barricaded door and intentionally set fire and the discovery of two knives near the bodies led investigators to believe John killed Joyce in a murder-suicide. No forced entry. Bedroom door blocked from the inside. $950 in cash on the bedside table. So it wasn't for the money. And very different stab wounds on each victim. The couple's family noticed detectives ignored odd things about the evidence, such as the blood patterns and type of knife that made the fatal blow. In a state known for its graft and shoddy police work, could there be something more to the case? It's not just a whodunit. This story is like a Russian doll. Every question I ask leads to another. Why would this mild-mannered grandfather kill his wife of 47 years? And why weren't the mysterious deaths of a prominent couple investigated? In the podcast Dead End, a New Jersey political murder mystery, WNYC reporter Nancy Solomon explores the brutal deaths of the Sheridans, their son's quest for the truth, and the political corruption that looms over the case. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Dead End. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. Now, Kevin, the podcast I think that Nancy Solomon was planning on reporting changed significantly when there was another similar case that sort of came to the fore where someone confessed to a crime very, very similar to the one she had been investigating for Mm -hmm. two years And she said, this sounds an awful lot like the podcast that I am creating. In both cases, people involved in politics were stabbed to death and the room set on fire. And both crimes happened just four months apart in 2014. Suddenly, people are interested again in a case I've been focused on for two years. What do you think it means to a journalist like Nancy Solomon when she has a story that she's investigating and all of a sudden it looks a whole lot more like the theory that this was a murder and not a murder-suicide is potentially true because there is another case that looks exactly like this, similar circumstances, a hitman, all that stuff that happens so late in the reporting. As a journalist, when you hear something like that, what do you think? Well, I get really excited because if the goal here is to poke holes in the official story about the murder-suicide and intimate that there was uh, an outside killer that came in and staged it, you know, that opens up a lot of questions about why as well as who and how. And like on its face, it ends up seeming a little fanciful, right? Mm -hmm. A little hopeful by the loved ones that they don't want to think of their father as somebody that, you know, murdered their mother. And by bringing this up and the closeness of these two crimes, it actually gives some credibility to that theory. I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't solved this murder, at least not yet. But I'm rattling a few cages and things might be changing. I'm getting phone calls from powerful people who want to know what I know. It's because in the beginning, the first couple of episodes, we hear about the case, we hear about their lives. I'm still listening and saying, this is really great, but I don't know if I'm buying this theory that it's anything other than, you know, what they say. You know, the armoire in front of the door and the, you know, and the, the official story makes sense on its face. But once I've kind of like already, okay, yeah, I'm in the other stuff's bullshit. Boom, she starts coming in with some really great stuff that, oh, all right, now I'm thinking about this case differently, and I want to hear more of what she's got to say. So, Laura, what do you think about this? The Sean Cattle uh, case and this element coming into the reporting so late in the game and, you know, these very, very, very similar sets of circumstances. I think for me, I would have preferred to hear that a little bit further closer to the front of the story. Because obviously this is somebody, you know, I I did a little research, like the most experienced political slash political corruption reporter in New Jersey for decades that she has been reporting on New Jersey. So, you know, she's got all of her sources in place. 
you know she's bringing you the best possible information. But in terms of just the order that the story was told in, I think I would have bought into this a little bit earlier. And we're telling it, she's telling it in this very linear fashion, like, here's what happened, here's what happened. Oh, surprise, here's this other case that's very similar. But me personally, I would have liked to hear this. Okay, so here is Sean. And by the way, in January, here's this guy. He's a political operative. He admits hiring two hitmen to kill this other guy who was a former candidate for a city council position. Like we're knocking off city council people in New Jersey now. Are you fucking kidding me? And these hitmen that he hired, like stabbed this guy and they set the place on fire. And we find out, you know, this guy was deeply involved in politics for decades. He had worked for lots of different people over the years. And I think if that had been brought up front right at the, you know, when we're hearing about the Sheridan murders, to me, that would have set it up in a way that like this sort of overarching corruption and theme of corruption in New Jersey and just how entrenched and widespread and how the tentacles are just everywhere would have felt a little bit more like, oh shit, I want to listen to this because man, they're like knocking off people left and right because I'm just going to go on a limb. I don't think it's a coincidence that Two people in the political world are killed in a very similar fashion. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Does anyone else feel that way? <laughs> no. I mean, I don't, she doesn't think it's a coincidence either because she goes ahead and states in episode four that she is looking at a murder and no longer looking at a murder-suicide. I mean, she says, I'm just going to go ahead and say that this was a murder, which I think is a very interesting assertion for this journalist to make. I mean, she's looking at the forensic stuff that Michael Baden brings to bear and then also this other case. But no, I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I mean, Toby, they do make a decision on this podcast that I think we are split on based on your notes. They definitely front end loaded the true crime aspect of this at the beginning. The Sheridan murders and the details of the murders and details of the investigation are front end loaded in the first three episodes of this podcast. I thought that was a really smart decision, but you have, you know, you sent me some notes that indicate that you don't think that the narrative structure worked as well for you. You know, in a, in a way, it's kind of hard at this point in the season to like make a judgment. Mm. But my feeling was like the first three episodes were kind of moving along and they had momentum and stuff. And you hit the fourth episode, which is largely about sort of a history of corruption in New Jersey and Jimmy Hoffa. And to me, it felt like it was just putting the brakes on the story. And it was like, so like, you know, it's not news that New Jersey has corruption issues. And part of it's probably the way, like maybe I'm not putting it, giving enough weight to the fact that she was doing this investigation for two years and just things changed. But it seemed to me that you had sort of three possible focusing points. One was the alleged murder-suicide. The second one was the corruption angle. And then the third one, which sort of suggests itself towards the end of her investigating work, is somebody's paying Hitman to knock off, you know, political people in New Jersey, which is nuts. I mean, that's like something from mm-hmm. a bad thriller. It's like a John Grisham book. Yeah, it's really, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty wild. So anyway, I kind of just question whether maybe thinking a little more creatively about how you wanted to frame everything. But I, I do get like, you've been focused on this one thing for two years. Another piece of information comes and do you just completely change like the whole focus of what you've been doing for all this time? Or do you try and assimilate what you've learned into the stuff that you've already done. But I I did, you know, she doesn't need me to say she's like a really good reporter. I mean, the reporting in this is excellent. I just kind of felt like maybe they could have been a little more creative with how they were putting stuff out there. So Kevin, I want to talk about the crime scene and how it was handled. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think it's very, very interesting that the Sheridan's kids are as connected as they are, especially the son that we hear the most from in the podcast, who was Chris Christie's attorney and, who has, campaign, and yeah. who has all these connections, you know, with the investigators and the attorney general's well, office and all that it's stuff. It's not surprising based on his, his, dad his being lineage connected. and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. But the idea that he would give the uh, investigators so much 
leeway and like trust them so much and like tell his siblings, no, no, they must know what they're doing and then go to the scene and immediately realize something is really, really wrong here. Right. And see that the one the one detail that really astonished me was how the cops apparently or or the firefighters, it was unclear, basically just took a bunch of stuff that was in the bedroom and just like tossed it in the bathroom, Mm -hmm. stuff that was in the way, including apparently this fire poker that had been used probably to like break a bunch of John Sheridan's ribs. Have you ever heard of such a thing of just like tossing evidence into a different room, like aside? Well, I would throw this that part of the question to Lara. She would know more about when the fire service runs in on a room, what they do with stuff that's in the way. I don't think it's uncommon to in the haste to push it someplace where it's not going to catch fire thing? out of the way. It's not like going to a homicide, well, like a traditional homicide scene where that's what you're confronted with. There's no fire, but you have, you know. But it was still there. Bomb. Right. Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> it, well, but, but it's about whether they threw it there and then about how come the cops didn't actually go look at it afterwards. Yeah, that's really what I mean is it was all still there. Well, Laura, what did you think about that? Well, I'm more concerned about that they're like, and then we just let this like reporter that we all know, like walk through the scene. And she's the one who's like, hey, something's going on here. I was like, okay, I had really good sources and I was very like in tune, but I was never allowed to go just like walk through a fire scene or a crime scene like that and just be like, oh yeah, we let so-and-so from the New Jersey media just like walk through the fucking crime scene. But I guess, Kevin, the only reason I could think that they would have moved that if it was an impediment to them extinguishing a fire. Right. right? And the fact that they just threw it out of the way, but was anyone else? I was having, mostly when I heard fire poker, I was like, oh fuck, the staircase. staircase. Yeah. That's a, I was like the staircase. And then a I'm blower, like, right? I was like, this is Blow like poke. the mashup of like the staircase and making a murderer all put into one is basically what happened in this case. Combined with political corruption, yeah. I didn't get any making the murderer vibes at all, but I did get staircase vibes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like the, um, first of all, the fire implement, but then also the kids sort of like having very strong feelings about the parents. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the case has is nothing like the staircase yeah. case, but that's obviously the zeitgeist right now. And I, I definitely had, a, you know, reminiscings of that story. Mm-hmm. I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. Hey, honey, how was your trip to Menards? Awesome. The Menards bag sale is back. Oh, uh, what's the bag sale? You grab a bag in store and save 15% on everything you can fit in the bag. I got a new cordless drill, LED bulbs to help with the electric bill, stocked up on toothpaste, always need batteries, and paint for the mudroom. Plus all my favorite snacks. Uh, where are you going? Menards, we're out of cleaning supplies. Hurry in. Grab a bag in store now through January 14th. Get 15% off everything you can fit in the bag. See store for complete details. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Um, Rebecca, hold that thought because I actually want to interrupt okay. you for once oh. and talk <laughs> I do it every, once. every episode to talk about the business section. All right, I'm going to start that music now. Please do. Right now on Patreon, you can listen to the latest episode of Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. How many different ways are we going to say it till people get the joke? Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Toby's like, uh, this I, has been so funny since first grade. Yeah. I was actually speaking on Zoom to some group, and the guy who introduced me like had read my bio beforehand, <laughs> oh. but like hadn't read it aloud. And so when he read that aloud, he just started cracking. <laughs> yes. Like, like, like uh, week week three or four of Olivia's job working for us, she was like, yeah. do you know that Toby's book club podcast has the words balls deep in it? I was like, I do. Yeah. That was on purpose. <laughs> but it is an excellent book club podcast. They're talking about the arsonist. And Toby, tell us a little bit about who your guests were and how that conversation went. Uh, so my guests were Elise McGovern, who's a criminology professor in Australia. 
Julia Lowry Henderson, who people will know from Bikram yeah. and uh, the Sterling Affair and all that stuff. And then uh, Keith Sharon, who works at the Tennessean now, but he did the Crime Beat podcast. He's also written the screenplay for a couple of movies. You know, the book is awesome. And we had a really interesting discussion. People had kind of brought different things from their background to bear Mm -hmm. on our discussion. You know, Keith has done some reporting on arsons and fires, which was super interesting. And then Elise is from Australia and was able to give some cultural stuff around the fires. And, you know, Julia is always very insightful uh, and 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 I just kind of tried to uh, you told me to keep, it keep moving. my head down as much as yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it was fun. It's it's a real and I recommend the book to people. Uh, even if you don't listen to the deep dive, you're looking for something to read. The Arsonist by Chloe Hooper is really good. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we've got all sorts of stuff uh, on Patreon. If you sign up at patreon.com slash partners in crime media, you can hear over 275 exclusive podcasts you only hear there, including the latest CWO after show, mm-hmm. our latest episode of Married with Podcast, in which we dispense advice to uh, one of the listeners who feels bad about having to enforce a deadline for <laughs> for an award, you know, a charitable award, and somebody wants to, like, two weeks later reply. It's like, why do you feel bad? Don't feel bad. That's right. Don't apologize. Deadline's it's, a deadline. Yeah, it's their fault. That's right. Uh, Family I'll, emergency, shmamly emergency. Yeah. A deadline's a deadline. Last thing I want to plug is uh, our latest episode of These Are Their Stories, the Law & Order podcast. It's a special one this week. As you know, we usually pick an episode from either Criminal Intent, SVU, or original recipe, and just to be a completist, we picked an episode from the uh, long-forgotten Law and Order, Los Angeles. It's fucking terrible. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Alfred Molina and Terrence <laughs> Howard and Alana De La Garza. Oh, she's so beautiful. She is. Uh, yeah. So in this episode, uh, we're talking with Sarah D. Bunting, who is a friend of the podcast, as always. And in the episode from uh, Law and Order LA, it's uh, a stylist yes. is murdered by. Well, somebody, and who is the first suspect they go to? Chloe Kardashian. Literally, Chloe Kardashian. Played by Chloe Kardashian <laughs> Odom. For fuck's sake. I really think that Chloe like turned to like those detectives and said, My dad said you framed his friend. So. <laughs> it was wild. It was yeah. a crazy episode and real stupid. But the episode of the Tats is really good, though. Really, really good. Yeah, yeah. All right, so Kevin, before we wrap up the business section, do we have any Patreon patron saints of the week this week? No. Okay, so that's no, I'm just like- kidding. Of course we do. All right, fake out. Our Patreon patron saints are Kristen Dye and Theodore LaBarbera. 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 Bless you. And thus ends. And thus ends. The business section. The business section. I'm going to fade that music out right now. Toby, what did you think just of those details? Because the investigators, as we heard, there were there were just clear misinterpretations of the evidence at the scene. We have this situation where there's blood on the wall. You hear the guy saying he didn't take pictures of it. He wasn't told to take pictures of it, and he didn't. There's misinterpretation of whether or not it was cast off blood versus blood from firefighters, you know, carrying the bodies down the stairs. You hear about the knife Michael Bodden, this famous forensic guy talking about the knife wounds not being hesitation wounds, but actually being fatal wounds caused by a different knife that was not at the scene. And that the coroner's report matched that, right? Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. So this was just clear investigative problems that for some (laughs) reason, like the officials in New Jersey are just not, they don't care about or something. I mean, it's just, it seems like incompetence and yeah, I mean, I didn't know, I I mean, I don't feel like I have any insight into it other than it doesn't seem like every, every homicide isn't going to have the first responder be somebody who's like a genius detective, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's just going to be whoever's close, whoever shows up. You know, you'd think that if you saw blood on the wall, maybe you'd just take a picture of it, even if you thought it was something else, but just, you know, on the offhand, you're wrong. And just making sure you get stuff right, that you're not throwing evidence around or tromping around in evidence. But, you know, we run into this, like, fairly frequently, right? Crime scenes aren't secured or pieces Mm -hmm. of evidence aren't handled the way they should be. So, you know, I I mean, I guess it's not that surprising. I mean, what's surprising is that... It happens in a case that 
people should have probably known was going to be super high profile just on the face of it. And that maybe, you know, maybe you want to take a little extra care on it, just knowing. And I think that's why Nancy Solomon got brought in is they want to have somebody kind of documenting what they're doing, right? Because I, I assume that given it's New Jersey and all the corruption and stuff, they want to have somebody documenting like, yeah, we're doing our jobs. Like we're not like hiding stuff. You know, we don't want this to come back on us later. Hmm. Just a guess. Speaking of documenting, mm -hmm. we have in the podcast thing that I love when they do uh, in journalism. Oh, I know what you're going to say, I think. <laughs> Which is a phone call with a threatening attorney asking Nancy Solomon to squelch any reporting on a subject of her reporting who is somewhat in the frame for this investigation, a person whose name I don't even want to say on my podcast for fear of me getting a call from these same scary ass New Jersey attorneys. I, and I don't want to get this to be adversary because if anyone even suggests, intimates or infers obliquely, directly, indirectly that George Norcross was somehow involved in, in John Sheridan's and Joy Sheridan's tragic death the next letter you receive from me is a litigation hold notice. Kevin, what do you think of the inclusion of this particular tape of this meeting? We should say that we know that New York, I don't know what the New Jersey rules are, where and when Nancy Solomon was that she recorded this call, but clearly it was probably a one-party consent situation. Well, no, I know. I, I, I'm sure that all the parties you were that the aware. the call was being recorded, yeah. Yes, for the, the purpose yes. of... It sounded to her like she thought that she would go through this and maybe have an opportunity, opportunity to ask questions. questions. Yes, because he was uh, on the call, right? Because he was on the call with yes. the camera off. Yes. And his pants off. No, I don't know that. But I can't <laughs> his pants off. Yes. That's an allegedly. Wow. Allegedly had his pants no, off. No, he did not have his pants off. Uh, I can't prove it Only either way. Only Kevin tapes with his pants That's off. That's right. Allegedly had his pants on. Allegedly had his pants on, but again, we cannot deny or confirm. What do you think about hearing those Jersey lawyers on well, tape? Well, yeah, I liked it. I, I certainly, they certainly were not taking the, um, the soft touch approach. There was no Dale Carnegie methodology to the discussion. Yeah, I loved the transparency of it. You know, she'd been talking about throughout this house, she keeps hitting roadblocks, which you can imagine that one would. But then all of a sudden, this is just creates some kind of excitement for me. Mm. Certainly, I hate to use this term, but, you know, when they say there, where there's smoke, there's fire, at least where there's smoke, there's the potential of fire in a podcast. And so now my eyes are wide to this and I, I want to know more about that guy. Yeah. So, Toby, how do you feel about how she handles it? Because they insist that she say that she has no evidence that he was involved in the murder. And that she has them on tape saying that, and she goes like, I told them I would consider it, but without a promise, the meeting ended abruptly. I, I think we're finished. I mean, we, we, we clearly... And I never got to ask my questions of George Norcross. Bye-bye, guys. I'm gone. Thank you. Thank you. But fair enough. I'll say it. I don't have any evidence that George Norcross had anything to do with the deaths of the Sheridans. <laughs> But that's after telling them that she's going to have to think about it. She's not so sure. <laughs> and then she hangs up. And then whenever she's recording this thing, she's like, oh, well, I'll go ahead and say it. I thought that was, that was a great piece of tape. You know, it, it just kind of shed some light on the pressures under which she's reporting on this story. Yeah, I mean, I like that because, I mean, obviously, WNYC has resources. They obviously have legal vetting of this material. You cannot put a story like this out without a lot of legal vetting, right? And so I would hazard a guess. I don't, I have no way of knowing this, that, you know, whatever attorney is working for the WNYC side is like, all right, well, there are things that we can and can't say. Mm -hmm. So this is language that we should include in some way. And this is a way to include it. That gets the spirit of what, you know, the reporter wants to do across, but actually including the language, right? Yeah. I fucking love it. I love it. I just think it's a really, really good way to do it and a clever way to do it, but also sort of showing you're not going to stop reporting the facts, laying out the connections here, whatever they may or may not be, evidence of a potential problematic land deal or whatever it is involving a lot of money that has some corrupt elements to it or wherever the story is going isn't necessarily a smoking gun, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't report those facts as well, you know? Yeah. 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 But, you know, I also like that by putting this behind the scenes 
Zoom call, making that part of the podcast, signpost something that we are supposed to understand. They would they didn't do this for one of the detectives or the lab tech who left the blanket out in the garage or whatever the hell that he did. They wanted to use that interaction with the lawyers going hardcore in defense of don't say anything bad about him as a way to signpost something else. Right. And There's, there are stakes around this guy. There are stakes around this guy. And that is intriguing. Yep. So, Laura, I will say you have to love a mystery. I mean, this is an older case, but there are so many clues, right? Even at the scene of the crime. Yeah. So many clues. Yeah. No, it's like one of those like board games. We've got the bent fire poker, the missing kitchen knife, a neighbor who sees a mysterious car. Yes. A knife with traces of DNA from another man. The second staircase. Why was it overlooked? How could investigators not see all this? So there's a lot going on in this case. And I think that only contributes to sort of this overarching feel of corruption in New Jersey and sort of like this undercurrent of seediness that permeates everything that happens in that state. But, you know, in this case, I think it just adds to that overall sort of feeling that something's not right here. And for me, I'm going to go back to what I said in the beginning. These two cases are so similar. These two murder cases where like people are stabbed and then there's a fire. And I really want to know what is behind all that in both of those. Like who is pulling the strings? Yeah. And then in the other case, the guy was pulled over a couple of days later with a kitchen knife in the car. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to know what happened with a kitchen knife. But like, I mean, there's just so many, like if there was a, yeah. I mean, I, you hear about the son being up at three in the morning, like pouring over the investigative files and his wife telling him he had to stop. But all I can think about is like the carry from Homeland board with all the strings and tape yes. there mm-hmm. must be on the wall. There's so much connective tissue here. I don't know. I, I can see why Nancy Solomon would want to report the story for two years because, you know, just listening to a couple of episodes of the podcast, there's already so much there there in terms of things to follow, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that we have the son who is like, just like he wants to get to the bottom of this case. And what I think is fascinating, again, is he's not somebody who is like a nobody. He's connected. He is Chris Christie's personal lawyer. He is already in position where you think he should be able to find out what the F is going on. But yet they keep putting up like roadblocks in front of him. Things aren't happening. Things aren't transpiring. You know, he is trying to find out what's happening. You find out like the police haven't even interviewed some of the witnesses in the case. There's evidence that's missing. So it is just cast doubt on everything when you find out that somebody that's in that position isn't even able to like utilize the old boys network to sort of get things moving in his own parents' murder. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just like, okay, what? what's, I'm just going to drive through New Jersey and I am not stopping. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to the car clue, Kevin? The neighbor who saw the car the week before on the same time of day? Could be. Yeah. I will say dead end about a murder case that took place in a cul-de-sac. I was just going to say. Excellent yeah. <laughs> name for a podcast. Excellent, excellent name for a podcast. I want people to understand this ordeal. It's taken a toll on both of us. Casey Anthony's parents respond after 15 years of allegations. I've gotten blamed for something I didn't do and it tears me up inside. This can change our life. This is serious. This is their final response. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. Hey, honey, how was your trip to Menards? Awesome. The Menards bag sale is back. Oh, uh, what's the bag sale? You grab a bag in store and save 15% on everything you can fit in the bag. I got a new cordless drill, LED bulbs to help with the electric bill, stocked up on toothpaste, always need batteries, and paint for the mudroom, plus all my favorite snacks. Uh, where are you going? Menards. We're out of cleaning supplies. Hurry in. Grab a bag in store now through January 14th. Get 15% off everything you can fit in the bag. See store for complete details. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. 
All right. Well, I think we should do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out Dead End, a New Jersey political murder mystery? It's a new podcast from WNYC, the big public radio station in New York. Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? Yeah, I'm going to go thumbs up with this. I mean, this came at us in sort of a traditional true crime narrative, linear format where everything started off sort of chronologically. You know, there's some things I would have perhaps told in different order, but Nancy Solomon is probably from what I've learned in sort of reading a little background in this podcast. She's like the most experienced person to be reporting on politics in New Jersey, corruption in New Jersey, crime in New Jersey. She's been doing this for decades. So you know that we have somebody that is giving us the best information that is out there about this case. And it's like the real life Sopranos that is unfolding as she is telling the story. And it's really interesting. And I guess there are some cases that might be tied. I'm not going to give away spoilers, but that is what I am interested in finding out about is where is this podcast? If we're going to zoom out, like we've talked about in other podcasts and see the big picture, how is this going to be connected? Where is this going to end? But overall, it's just really interesting because New Jersey just sort of has that vibe as the place where sort of some seedy things happen in this case. Not just a vibe. Well, I'm saying not just a vibe on New Jersey. There's some shit that goes down. I will never forget. I went to a graduation party in New Jersey for college. And one of my friend's fathers was in the waste management industry. And we all camped out in their yard. And at the end of the the party, I was like sitting around talking with the father. And he was like, you got things that are uh, bothering you. You call me Mr. And I'll just take (laughs) care of it. I was like, what the fuck? But like, it was for real. And that is just the way it rolls in New Jersey. And I was like, and I have never forgotten that. I remember sitting in that back and being like, oh, Mr. is going to take care of some shit for us. Okay, great. Thanks, New Jersey. Not a stereotype if it's true. Listen, I'm from Long Island and there's some of that there too. (laughs) There may have come a time when he had a favor to ask of you. (laughs) (laughs) And if I didn't do it, I was going to be swimming with the fishes. (laughs) <laughs> Toby Ball, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Dead End, a New Jersey political murder mystery. I feel like this story, when when this uh, series is over, like this is potentially just a crazy story that is being reported. I kind of felt like I didn't connect with it as strongly as I was hoping I would. It's told very traditionally. You know, it, it's it, it's very straightforward. So I think part of that, like I don't think they embrace some of the things that makes like these really, really good true crime podcasts, what they are. And instead that just seems like a sort of a long form reporting endeavor. That being said, I mean, the reporting is really good. The story is potentially just nuts. I see that it's very high on the charts and I get it. I just kind of feel like it could have been great with a little bit more creativity or sort of looking at a podcast as being something more than just, you know, a long radio story. Yep. That being said, I'll give it a thumbs up. I mean, I, I think this is one of those ones where it may end up just turning out to be really, really compelling when it's over. Kevin Flynn. I'm going thumbs up. I really love Nancy Solomon's reporting. I think that she does a great job just communicating the story in this format, you know, you could tell she must have been at WNYC for like a million years, right? She must have worked with Marconi or something because she just got it down. And yeah, she can make sort of any part of the storytelling process sound very conversational, whether it's talking about a crime or it's talking about background on politics or corruption. She has a great way of, of delivering it. At first, I was not really buying the idea that the main story, the official story was wrong and she's making me come around to rethink that. So I do like it when uh, you have the power to change a viewer's mind or change their perception of something uh, when you tell the story the right way. And that's what she's doing. So I'm going thumbs up. Yeah, I really like this podcast, too. I will say we've heard a couple of really great public radio podcasts lately, and uh, there hasn't been a lot of great public radio podcasts coming our way in the last couple of years. So I'm very heartened by what our uh, friends at different public radio stations have been doing. Um, This podcast is really, really, for lack of a better word, 
fun for the story that it's doing. It was really, really smart decision, I think, to front load the true crime part of the story in the first couple of episodes, Uh, not only for the sort of the great hook component of it, but because the crime story itself is really, really interesting. As Laura laid out, there are like a lot of clues, a lot of mystery, a lot of um, really compelling, like traditional sort of twisty, turny, true crime components here that are a great bedrock for the larger political story that I know this podcast is going to be telling. This is definitely a podcast where once we're done reviewing it, I'm going to continue listening because I really want to know where it goes. And I know that as as of now, Nancy says, you know, at this time, she has not yet solved this case. And I'm not sure the podcast will solve the case, but I think it has the potential to move the needle on it in a way that we haven't heard in a while, or at least move the needle on it in the political sphere or in the investigative sphere. I don't know. I'm really enjoying this podcast a lot. So I got to give a big thumbs up for Dead End. uh, And I'd really recommend that you guys check it out. All right, that should do it for us. But before we go, Lara Bricker, do we have a cat of the week this week? We do have a cat of the week this week. Um, So our cat this week comes to us from Tove Nilsson. Tove writes, this is Bella. And and the reason, first of all, I picked this cat is because they clearly have some sort of weird skin thing and haircut going on. And I was like, this is an interesting cat and I need to know their story. And that is why I picked this cat. This is Bella, my Italian diva. I got her when I lived with my ex-boyfriend in Italy. And the first thing out of my mouth when he dumped me was the cat comes with me. Show Toby that cat. Here she is looking a bit like Steve Jobs or maybe E.T. after an operation where the vet removed her inner ear. It is one of the ugliest cats I've ever seen. So now she's a half deaf dive. She's my baby and my best friend. And I love her to bits. Good for that person, because that is one. I mean, (laughs) that is an ugly cat. Uh, So ugly. It's cute. Don't you guys remember when I wanted to adopt that like weird Scottish cat that had been totally shaved that looked equally freaky? It looks like a cat wearing a hoodie. (laughs) Toby, are you in the Cat of the Week channel or do you not have access to it? The Cat of the Week channel must be where you guys just like talk trash about me. No, it's just got a little funny uh... hair. You know what? It looks like a cat that has had a little, it's got a skinny neck. It looks like a cat cat. that was, um, (laughs) it looks like a cat. You know how some people like eat the outside of the corn, like, and then like the save the inside part for last. It looks like a cat. Someone did that with this cat. (laughs) <laughs> yeah did you get the picture toby i just sent it to i did yeah. yeah look at the poor cat though and i love it i'm like i would probably want to take that cat with me too because i would I, I would feel like zelda my kitty zelda who was just over here like i'm very she's a weird cat and not a lot of people would understand her because she is very shy you look at her she runs away but she's a really sweet cat and so when you come to appreciate a unique animal not everybody appreciates your unique animal the way you do. Yeah. Especially when they're so, ugly. Yeah. Can I, can I ask I, I a follow up question? The cat's ugly. What? Yes, Toby. You just said a second ago, you said Zelda, who has become a real cat. <laughs> she has so, become a real did, cat. Did she used to be, was she used to be an imaginary? She's cat? made out of <laughs> like wood <what>? and string. <laughs> She's like Pinocchio, Toby. Yeah. Mm. Now, you know what? I say that I just saw the lady who rescued her the other day. And you know what it is? Is that for the, the beginning of Zelda's life, she spent a lot of time like living in the closet. And now she comes out and she hangs out with the uh, She comes out of the closet. She's come out of the closet. She hangs out with the boy cats. And occasionally she tries to meow and she goes, and it's like a little croak. And I actually witnessed her lick the side of one of the other cat's tail. So she's trying to become a cat like the other. She's trying to like, but it's taken her like six years Mm. to learn how to socialize with other cats. I've got so many more follow-up questions to that explanation, (laughs) but I think we just got to like finish up this There was a guy who grew a dick on his arm and it didn't take that long. (laughs) She's a unique cat. She's the most difficult cat I've I've ever owned. All right. Well, if Laura Bricker, if uh, folks want to reach out to you and find out more about your cat who has allegedly become a real cat now that she is out (laughs) of the closet, how can they find you on Twitter? They can find me at Lara Bricker. And Toby Ball, folks want to uh, audit the questions that you have for Lara Bricker about her now real cat. How can they find you on Twitter? At Toby Ball NH. 
Kevin Flynn, how can folks find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to see a photograph of that cat, <laughs> you can check our Twitter feeds. But the best way is to sign up for our free newsletter at crimewriterson.com. You'll get it later today. And uh, plus all of Kevin's very personal thoughts. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. Follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On and join our incredible community and our official Crime Writers On Facebook group. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll get the Crime Writers On After Show, Married with Podcast, Lara Bricker's Leave it to Bricker Podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the very wonderful Olivia Burdett. The executive producer of this show is Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our New Hampshire basement, where we also overlook critical evidence based on our preconceived notions of the crime. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. Later. Our Patreon patron saints are Kristen Dye and Theodore La Bar- La Barbera Bar- 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 Barbara Barbara La Barbara That's what I would say. Kristen Dye and Theodore La Barbera. La Barbara. La Barbara. La Barbara? Yeah. Theodore La Barbara. Wait, Toby knows. Yes. It's not Barbara, it's La Barbara. Well, I would have been Barbara. Okay. L A B A R B E R A. La Barbara. La Barbara. All right, what the fuck? Let me do I'm it. going with Theodore La Barbara. All right. Sorry, Livy. Our Patreon patron saints are Kristen Dye and Theodore. La Barbara. La Barbara. La Barbara. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Just leave both in and let's see which one it is. I think Theodore, we- let us know. <laughs> The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value.